welcome to Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutforth and this week's special guest, Lena Norris. Hey. Hello. This week we're talking about worries with warming and a coming collapse, but first, we have a wee review! This one is five stars, it says, A fascinating and engaging podcast. I've listened to every episode of Sci Guys and find it a great way to start my week. I especially like the topics that deal with crazy experiments, mental illness, gender, and sexuality. Are those all the same thing? Who knows? Um, recently a doctor diagnosed me with ADHD, and it was your episodes on autism and ADHD that helped me realize this about myself. Thanks, Sci Guys. I look forward to more crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. Isn't that nice? I can't wait for the right wing media to tell us that Psy Guys is giving people ADHD. <laughs> oh, we're giving it's people contagious. ADHD and autism. Yes! Yes! You coughed on everyone. It's a digital cough. <laughs> and speaking of digital cough, this is something entirely unrelated. It's a question for you here and everyone who's watching or listening at home. If you're listening on Spotify, you know what to do. Get down to the comments. Same goes for YouTube. But if you're elsewhere, Apple or CastBox or somewhere else that you use only your ears, here's what you do. Set the atmosphere on fire. I don't care how you do it. Just set it on fire, okay? And then use this flaming atmosphere to send smoke signals to Mars. My Martian friends will let me know what your answer is. Anyway, the question is, are you anxious about climate change? I am a little anxious. <laughs> but I think an anxious implies that it's not a logical response. So I'd like to question the question. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I agree. I think, that's, uh, I think that's giving you a very good idea of where this episode is going. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, how do you feel about climate change? Positive, right? That's what you were saying to me earlier. Poor, I can't wait, Love man. It. Oh. Change it more. Oh, you don't need to wait. It's happening already. <laughs> oh, well, even better. <laughs> <laughs> Am I anxious about climate change? Yeah, I'm anxious about climate change. I think like everybody, probably not as much as I should be. Like most people should be more anxious than they are. Uh, and that's probably another bit of the episode I've spoiled. On we go. <laughs> <laughs> teased. Not spoiled, teased. Spoiled. Shall we start off with some climate change statistics? Just to get us all riled up and anxious, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Lena, you, you have those ready to go, don't you? You oh, prepared yeah, some? Oh, yeah. Um, climate change is 100% bad. Uh-huh, very good, very good. And I think we have a 30% chance of solving it. <laughs> How's that for a start? Well, that's good. That's good. And I have uh, I have a little thing to share with you all. It's, it's a podcast. It's not this one. It's another one. Do you know anything about that podcast? No. It's oh, mine. Yeah, it's yours. Oh, mine. Yes, I have a podcast called No Books on a Dead Planet, which is the only way I can make myself panic about the climate is thinking about how there won't be any books there. Problematic. But people can't register. Plants, no, it's not going in. Books, that feels like an emergency. You need plot to make books, though. So. Yeah, you do. That's so deep. Um, no trees without books. Have you ever heard of an books. audiobook yeah. or, or, a, or a Kindle, huh? What is the person who reads the audiobook read from? Paper. A Kindle. <laughs> no. Duh. Oh, God. From their mind. <laughs> they just improvise. <laughs> yeah. From the stars. But no, yeah, if you want a little stepping stone from this podcast to that one, uh, we did an episode together. I mean, you had me on as a guest for your episode. We did it together. It was a group effort. It we was, buddy it was read a book. In this same room, actually. It was. Yeah, you can't see time. it. It's audio only. We read um, The Uninhabitable Earth, which is the scariest book on climate I've ever read. So thank you for accompanying me through that. True trauma. <laughs> uh, don't worry, there were no ghosts, so I was well okay. You were surprisingly upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I like That's the idea of a feedback. dead planet. I love it. it I'm like, sense. yeah, let's, woo! <laughs> no, I'm um, joking, of course. It was a fantastic episode. Thank you for having me on. And go ahead and listen to that uh, once you finish listening to this and all of our other episodes as well. Um, thought I'm in. Who knows? Anyway, climate change stats. Uh, what what do you think is going on with the climate? Is it is it getting hotter? Is it getting colder? Or is it staying the same? Both. But on average, warmer. Very Hotter good. where it shouldn't be, colder where it shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, basically everything's going wrong. So, Unideal places. Uh, but climate change, that, the climate changes normally. No, uh, ice ages have happened. The opposite of iced ages have happened. Is climate change not normal? I think at this rate, maybe not. Ah. Is that the, yeah, that would, <laughs> you would be answer. right. <laughs> the Earth's current rate of uh, change in climate has not been seen in the past 10,000 years. So that's... um. 
That's quite a while. Mm. You remember 10,000 years ago? Either of you? It's all a haze. I was probably drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and you, would drunk on like, oh. you would have been drunk on like rotting fruit 10,000 <laughs> yeah, years ago. Definitely. What do you think people get drunk on now? <laughs> well, okay, but rotting fruit, but like... Just like from under my actual toes, like picking it from my, oh, <laughs> from my actual it's, toes. I'm yeah. moving on, okay? So the <laughs> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have said, since systematic scientific assessments began in the 1970s, the influence of human activity on the warming of the climate system has evolved from theory to established fact. So if you think that climate change doesn't exist, that's pretty stupid, to be honest. Like, I'm, I, I could be nice as dumb. It's a really dumb thing, thing to think. Stop it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, if, we, if we look at sort of ice um, cores, rocks, tree rings, you know, ask the plants what they think. Um, basically, just look at all of the, all of the metrics we've got for the planet. Um, we can see that the climate is bloody changing. Uh, all them species that were that are that are dying, that's another signal of the climate being yeah, changing. Yeah, we should ask them about it. I'd love to, Luke. I'd love to. But they're all dead. Oh no! <laughs> They've gone the way of the dodo, and not because they were delicious and very easy to capture. Or maybe that's not how the dodo died. I don't know. Who cares? We'll do a bonus episode on it anyway. <laughs> So the land and ocean, the combined land and ocean temperature has increased at an average of 0.14 degrees Fahrenheit. Why did I read that one out? Disgusting. 0.08 degrees Celsius for everyone, um, except for those in uh, that continent. Um, and that's per decade since 1880. So that's 0.08 degrees Celsius per decade since 1880. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. That's mm. an average global temperature. Bearing in mind, like, I mean, if we if we think about that, uh, what is it? The Uninhabitable Earth? The un mm -hmm. Whatever the book that we read. That I don't remember <laughs> anything about any, at this point. Um, a few degrees of warming is very bad. It's devastation. That's mm. uh, Every degree is like a completely different world. Yeah. Yeah. It, we can't survive in our current sort of uh, civilizations uh, with, you know, four, five, six, seven degrees. Seven degrees of warming is insane. Like on average, like I feel like people are thinking, oh, but like the difference between, you know, it being 20 degrees in summer and 27 degrees in summer is, is not that bad. So that's fine. Averages. Think about how averages work. Yeah, it's you not... could also have no change in average temperature, but then like your summers are 50 degrees and your winters are like negative 30 degrees and it averages out to the same temperature. Yeah. It's 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 the volatility. It's also the volatility of the temperature as yes. well as the average that's important. Absolutely. So you could literally have no climate change average. We don't have that, but you could have no climate change average and that could still be worse if the biggest and the smallest cancel each other out in the average. Yeah, absolutely. And bear in mind as well that just slight changes in temperature can be very bad for other creatures on this planet. Like coral um, can't deal with too many changes in temperature. There are plenty of animals, for example, uh, wherein the sex determination is the temperature that the eggs are at. Yeah, weird. Mm. And like you can, like, I, I, okay, I may be, like take this with a grain of salt, look it up yourself, but I have read somewhere that they have seen some, I think maybe crocodiles or snakes or some kind of, some kind of reptile, they've, like, you know, too many of them are being born, I think, female or, or whatnot, because the eggs are the wrong temperature. Uh, like, somewhere around that area. Have a look into it yourself. But, like, that general idea is something that I have seen before. Um, and it's not just, you know, uh, it's not just temperatures going up. There's also, uh, I was going to say heat waves, but wildfires, floods, tropical storms, droughts, hurricanes, all of these sorts of things. Do you remember back when we were younger than we are now? Um, maybe about a decade and a half ago, when like hurricanes weren't all that common. No, they were big news. It was like, there's a hurricane. It was like, oh, yeah. So enough for us to hear about it in Britain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now it feels like there aren't any hurricanes, but I feel like that's just because there are so many hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. That we're just not we hearing hear about them. them. Yeah. yeah. We've gone through the alphabet several times now, naming women after. <laughs> <laughs> We've yeah. gone through Katrina. That feels like a long time ago. Sorry, naming women after hurricanes. Wait, naming <laughs> hurricanes after women. That's where women get their names. Hurricane Lena, <laughs> 1982. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> Good God. But seriously, right? Like these like natural disasters that we called them. It feels like the term natural disaster just isn't mm. applicable anymore. Mm. Um, and if this is stressing you out, good. Um, so <laughs> Sit with that emotion. Yeah. Don't push it away. Sit with it. Sit with us in it right now. <laughs> um, no matter where you are, if you're on the bus, if you're not on the bus, the two places that one could be, um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's true. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Yeah. 
categories. <laughs> on the bus or not on the bus. It's a binary category. There is literally nowhere else you could be. <laughs> <laughs> what about like half of you on the bus? Like as you get on the bus. When you're on the in bus. In the process of being ejected from the bus. So you're yeah. still on. Until you are behavior. fully off the bus, you're on the bus. You nah, know? I think this is the problematic binary rearing its ugly head. You're a problematic binary. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> So 3.6 billion people um, already live in areas which are, what do you think, about, what do you think the end of the sentence is? At risk of disappearing. Highly susceptible to climate change. So, uh, yeah, more or less. What percentage was that? Uh, that's 3.6 bi- billion people already live in areas highly susceptible to that's climate change. That's like half of, of the people. people. That's half of the people that's we have. Pro- yeah, nearly the half team. the people. Yeah. That's half of the team. Yeah, it's like all of the women. What if all of the women were to go? Then we're just left what? with all the dudes. What would we use these hurricane names for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I'm, I don't know what to name after my hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's been naming their penises after hurricanes and snow. I'm surprised men don't already name their penises after hurricanes. I'm going to move I'm on. I'm disappointed from that. to find out that's not the case. <laughs> I thought that was something that was happening without my supervision. So between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from undernutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress alone. Not all, just just those things I mentioned. Not that's, even like the, I don't like it. The yeah, being very like drowned. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I suppose that won't happen. It's I, slow enough that you probably won't drown. It depends how slow you are, Luke. It like, really depends. That's, that's true. Who knows? But no, seriously. Yeah, I mean, like ultimately, you got to think about it this way, right? If water levels rise, I feel like people don't think about this, and I think we've mentioned this um, in another episode. I think we even mentioned this um, mm. on your podcast, mm. Lena. Uh, when people think about water levels rising. I mean, and I feel like I definitely used to think about this. They think about the the water coming closer to them. So if you say, oh, there's, uh, there's a meter of water rising. They're like, ah, yeah, the water, the shore is getting a meter closer than it was before. No. no the water level is going up a meter. So if you have a very so, flat mm-hmm. area of land near your coast... All of it's under the water. Yes, yes. Hasta la bye-bye. Um, obviously, there's more complex things at play there as well. But but yeah, things are going to be underwater. And I don't think people realise how many countries are protected by by ocean barriers right now that, mm. will, that would split. Mm. So it's not actually just a gradual thing. Like the whole of the Netherlands. It could, do you know what I mean? Yes. There's, like, there's lots of places that are actually already below water level. Oh, water sea level, level, yeah. Sea level. And they're only protected by these very precarious concrete barriers that wouldn't withstand more. So they'd become lakes. Yes. Like the Great Lakes, you know, like um like Lake Michigan, except it's it's all of Netherlands. Yep. And what would we do without what would we do without the Dutch, huh? What would we do without people that were thought it was okay to do blackface at Christmas until, you know, about four years ago? Huh? <laughs> what would we do without them? No, I like the Dutch. I don't I don't know. I just want to bring that one up. Then like their new leader though. I don't know. Yeah. I, I literally know nothing about their new leader. It's bad news, that's what I know. Oh cool, good. So, good to know. Really bad. I, I don't want to think about that. I'd rather be anxious about the climate. Okay. Um so <laughs> I don't think this guy's anxious about the climate. Oh, uh, oh, I have heard about this actually, and I I want to continue not thinking about it. Uh but yeah, ultimately this is all happening and it, it's going to continue happening until we actively try to stop it and even then it's going to continue happening we're past the point of stopping it right we are now in a point at, like you know in an era where we just need to limit the damage mm. and the longer we take to do that the more we kick the can down the road and pretend green energy isn't you know um isn't sort of feasible because it doesn't make certain people enough money uh, the, the like the worst things are going to be for everyone and you know we've all said this or, or rather We've all been present while I've said this. I don't really listen to what anyone else says, sorry. But um, no, uh, we've, we've all been present for uh, the conversations around the human race not dying out, but things just being drastically changed, right? Like, you know, the world is going to change so, so drastically that many people are going to die. We'll probably still keep on surviving, but not not in the way that we do now. And also a lot of poor people will die, a lot of vulnerable people will die, and... Fingers crossed, rich ones too. But hey, silver linings. Can't have everything. <laughs> oh, you know. But yeah, no. I mean, do you guys do you guys have any uh, climate change stats or facts or things that are coming to mind you want to throw out? I think I, something I learned recently. I went to this ethical consumer conference because, of course, I did. <laughs> so I do in my spare time, and I learned that there's enough there's enough um, daylight uh, over an hour for us to collect to power the whole world for a year. So the actual, like the actual amount of resources we have to solve it, are all there, and the idea that we can't use green energy is wild. That's something that's not completely related, but something that I was like, there are solutions. It's just that there's so many like infuriating things to learn 
that just I just don't understand why we're being sold that it's impossible. Well, the, the one thing I would me. like to add on that, um, mm. I'm I'm currently reading a book called How the World Really Works. I think it's called, mm. um, and it's it's talking about how we very much really need to do something about this. Mm. But um, I haven't finished it. I wish I'd finished it by now in order to be on this episode. Um, <laughs> but it, it talks a lot about how like the stuff that we get from petrochemicals are so deeply embedded in everything mm. that it's actually way more complicated than any of the politicians who are saying like it, it, the solutions are all there we just need to implement them they 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 either don't understand or they're lying um because like all of our lubricants come from from like so anything turning mm. comes from petrochemicals and then like a lot of our fertilizers come from chemicals uh, from petrochemicals, so from from oil, and like I'd never quite appreciated. I didn't know that. Yeah, right. Mm. How deeply because we we get our we get the oil out of the ground, and like some of it becomes petrol or plain fuel or diesel fractional distillation, and then but then a bunch of the other stuff is like some of it becomes Lego, and then some of it becomes lubricants, and some of it becomes fertilizer, and some of it becomes all these other things. Which like if we absolutely um, eradicated oil from the pipeline like hmm. pun intended um then we'd have to either continue digging up oil in order to continue getting those things that we do still need or find alternatives some of which we don't have alternatives for yet um and it was just a very interesting read like mm. i really recommend it. anyone who wants to learn more about like the realities of this it's it's really interesting read and it, it is scary the the magnitude of the problem we we face because ultimately the the knock on th thing that will happen from the economic perspective, is if we like outlawed using petrol, for example, and diesel and plain fuel coming from oil, you'd still have to dig up oil in order to make those other things if you don't have alternatives to them. Mm. And so you'd you'd have a surplus of a bunch of like this fuel that you're not allowed to burn, and all those other things would become more expensive because they're not being subsidized by the price of the petrol that you get to sell from the oil you've dug up. It's a lot to absorb to say. I think what we have to absorb is that we have to rebuild everything from around 1880 onwards. Anything we, we've invented, we need to yeah. maybe just go back and reinvent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, but we don't have 120 years or 140 years. Yeah. We've got maybe 10. Yeah. So that's the kind of innovation problems. Yeah. I think the, the kind of point that this book, I, again, I haven't finished it, but I, the kind of the point that it sort of suggests that it's going to make in its introduction, for example, is it sort of says like there isn't really a way of solving this problem that means that we all get to maintain our standard of living. No. We all need to take a standard of living cut in order to fix this or we're screwed. Or we just don't have a living. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, well. But people don't think like that. But when like, you think about like our they standard. They're willing to give up their standard of living. Yeah. But when you think about our standard of living, right, it is kind of unreasonably high, right? Like yeah. American consumerism in, in particular, right? You know, you walk into a Walmart and there are 20 to 30 different brands who are all owned by the really, like realistically, like three companies for one individual kind of product, right? It's not necessary, right? Mm. That's not a necessary thing that we need. There are so many unnecessary products, so many things that we don't need that are just being made. If we think about like the lithium batteries that are in vapes that are just being disposed of constantly, right? We are so incredibly wasteful. And I think that like ultimately taking a standard of living cut isn't going to be as bad as people perceive it to be, right? Yeah. Like people were fine, you know, uh, you know, like ultimately we've got medical advance, uh, advancements and whatnot, right? Like ideally we focus primarily on stuff that is essential, like, mm -hmm. you know, med like medical fields and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff, right? And yeah. Maybe you don't get the convenience of Amazon delivering you something the same day that you ordered it. Maybe you don't get the convenience of going to the shop and having, you know, a uh, fruit that is not in season in your country and barely in season in the country where it's been delivered from, right? Mm. Maybe we don't get to do that. Maybe we don't get to travel to other countries, um, you know, multiple times a year by plane. Maybe we don't get to do all of those things. Mm. So what? Like, yeah. uh, like, re like, realistically, is like, is that going to be so, like, so bad that? It, it's it's worth just tanking the entire planet. Of mm -hmm. course, but the trouble is, is no one, or at least the majority of people, won't vote for it. So, mm -hmm. like, it it, you, it has to be kind of forced on you. But the majority of people will vote for it if it's framed in the right way. If they framing, understand what they're voting for. Yeah, exactly. If it's like if if you say to someone, "Hey, um, you have a choice of dying 
or being slightly less comfortable than you are right now. Oh, yeah, I know. But the other side's not saying, let's die. They're saying, this is being blown out of proportion. Exactly, These but they're are lying. are yeah. yeah. liberal no, idiots. My, then my point <laughs> is that it's not like, it's not a case of, oh, people won't vote for it. Um, it's a case of people will vote for it. They just won't vote for it if they're being lied to. Uh, but mm. they will be lied to. No, I know, I know, so I know. Like, no. how do we? Like, no, no, I, I just, I know, I, I agree with you. you I just want to be clear that the, the liars out of it. I want to be clear that the, that the situation here is not the, the problem. Is not oh, we'll have to take a standard of living cut. People won't uh, want to do that. The problem is people are going to lie to get their way, which is harmful to everyone. Mm -hmm. Right? I think it's about reframing what the problem is because the problem isn't standard of living cut. I mean, ultimately, right now, the standard of living in the UK is its kind of decreasing. The cost of living is increasing, and it, it, it's not getting better. It's not like we're paying more for even the same. Mm. In a lot of cases, you're paying more for worse, mm. right? Like, things are not great right now, um, and they don't seem to be getting much better. And again, we're very lucky in the UK. And when I say lucky, I mean... We're lucky to have been born now in this country after we took everything from everyone else. Yay. Um, but seriously, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, we're quite lucky in the UK, but it's we don't need all that we've got. Do you know what I mean? Can I just mm -hmm. say another as another statistic, which I, again, I'm going from memory from this book, which demonstrates exactly what you're saying there, Corey. Um, this absolutely blew my mind. So it was trying to put into perspective how much energy or power or like potential the average person has because of the Industrial Revolution and our use of petrochemicals and all those kind of things. Like how much, you, you know, you've got your will. Oh gosh, You've yeah. got your like, I want this thing to happen. And how much more powerful are you now than you were, I can't remember what year, but like say in 1880, right? And the statistic was that the average person, it's like they have 200 members of staff 200 years ago. Really? Or 100 years ago. I'm going to read this book. Like, You're selling term, it to me. Yeah, in terms of like, how much food you can have, the fact that some of it can be delivered to your house, the fact that electricity is generated and it costs relatively cheap, um, the fact that you have water flowing to your house. The, everything you have is the equivalent of by some year, compared to some year, like you have 200 full-time staff, <laughs> which is absolutely mind-blowingly well, insane. And yet we're still miserable. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Because I was we, walking around Birmingham yesterday and I was like, everybody is miserable here. But Nobody's happy. we have happy. to be miserable. But we have to be miserable. <laughs> because otherwise we won't want the stuff. Yeah. Like, how can we... Okay, like, ultimately, I like all I want, right? I don't need to have... Um, Amazon delivering me stuff like when it like when we order it right it's very convenient for the podcast to be like hey Luke can you can you I we want I, I want thing I have problem and looks like problem solved it's coming to your house in two to three days nice great that's very convenient but also I, I wouldn't mind um having like you know if the communities were built for this just having to go to the city center and get the thing because yeah. that's what I had to do 10 years ago, if right? If the shops in the city centre were open and if they sold your thing, which they don't at the moment because, because of they're Amazon. All, because of Amazon, right? Like, uh, and ultimately, mm. like, I don't need, like, okay, yeah, Just Eat was really cool. Getting, like, uh, you know, a food delivered to your house from your phone. Awesome. Great. But, like, going down to a, a takeaway, that's still fine. But mm. also, I'm cooking for fun. It's, it's fun. wholesome. But also cooking for myself. I Like, the only reason, I think largely the reason that people don't cook for themselves isn't out of, like, Oh god, like I'm lazy. Like it's exhausting. Yeah, we are working yeah. more for less money and it's becoming harder and harder to do all of the things that one needs to like we lived in a society up until, you know, we're not living in a society anymore. No, but we lived in a society, you know, very recently wherein you had one person whose entire job was make house okay. Make food, look after children, uh, and keep house. And whilst someone else went out and did other job to make money, to you know, facilitate all of that, and now, like a two, like a, a you know, a, a household that with uh, two people earning income, still isn't necessarily enough to live super comfortably, depending on where you live and like you know how like how much income you're making. Like if we talk about minimum wage, right? That's way too low, like ridiculously low. If you're not able to raise a family, um, you know, of four, let's say you know like uh, two parents, two children, on uh, minimum wage. For what from one person? It's not that's, a living wage. That's not a living wage. Yeah, that's literally not a living wage. And what is the point if it's not? 
Exactly. Like, what's it for? <laughs> what it's for Jeff Bezos to get ripped? Like, that's my yeah. point. Right? But what's so, the living? What's the minimum wage for? No, it's it's the minimum wage. It's not a living. But wage. what's the minimum wage for? It's for how how little money you're allowed to give poor people. No, but I mean, they... what's it for if not to like? Okay, Luke. Luke. <laughs> it's so stupid. Luke, Luke, it has the that. living wa- wage foundation <laughs> trying here's, to make the living wage and the working wage here's the how same it works, thing. Right? Do you guys remember guillotines that? Yeah. Chop, right? Ah, yes. Now, the living, the the, the the minimum wage has to stay um, as low as possible, but still above uh, what I like to call uh, the guillotine line, which um, is the line whereby uh, the poor people start cutting off your heads. So, so long as you keep it as low as possible, but above that line, you're fine. Uh, living wage doesn't matter at all, uh, so long as the poor aren't revolting. And they are revolting. And they should be revolting. Sorry, that was, that was three different uses of the word, word revolting. But seriously, like it's it's literally just a case of how little can you pay people before they go. Uh, well, I know. Yeah. So you're saying we should, but we they should wouldn't revolt. admit that. So what do they? What would they claim it's for? <laughs> They'd claim it's for something else, and so it should be at that line, the line that they claim it's for. It's for. Okay, here's what it is. It's for. Um, it's not. It's not for serious people who are working. It's for teenagers and no, because uh, they have a different part-time. they have a different minimum wage. That's already implemented no, in law. They have a different no, minimum wage. It's for people who are who haven't got the skill set to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Just you, you ungrateful. Oh, you paying attention to the things that we say, oh, um, holding us to the standard that which we claim to set ourselves to. Oh, you so annoying. <laughs> but, but yeah, no. Um, all of this. So I mean, standard of living being lower would probably be fine if we had communities that were set up to like. Ultimately, nuclear power can give us a lot of energy, right? Mm-hmm. So that's like our energy our issue with energy is not a problem right we can get our energy yes there are products and whatnot that require um lubricants and all of these sorts of things we can um continue using those things whilst we work work on developing like alternatives um and make the change more gradually because ultimately right you know like we need to limit the problem as much as possible and it it is possible it's just difficult and not and not immediately um, monetarily beneficial, so it's just being framed as being oh, it's a really difficult. Th-. No, it's just you're just gonna lose money. That's fine. That that's okay. I'm interested in the people who aren't experiencing eco anxiety and are the people that Luke are talking about, where they're just like they're going to lie to the public or they're running these businesses or they. I'm interested as, as to whether they actually believe the climate change data and they just think that they're exempt from it. <laughs> Well, Boris well, Johnson doesn't don't, understand. Well, then is the, the, they understand don't actually understand maths. it. Do you know what I mean? Like, is it that they think that they're exempt from it? Is it some kind of removal of like reality, or is it that they just don't get it and I, we need to explain it again? Like, wh- I think or, it's a spectrum. And they're also building bunkers, some of them. So I think it's a spectrum, and I think some people are just fundamentally. I say fundamentally. Uh, it's not a sort of fundamental innate part of their car- of their being. I just mean mm. fundamentally in terms of their decision making process. Uh, are selfish, fundamentally selfish. Mm. And also I think that they don't necessarily identify with their future selves. Because it would be a selfish act to preserve yourself and do this. Yeah. That's what's confusing to me is that they are selfish. But that's the thing. You can still preserve yourself. You just don't preserve anyone else. Uh. But I also think that sometimes some people don't um, think, like calculate what would be best for them in 30 years because they don't consider 30 years from now self them. Mm. I don't think they're factoring that into their equations. It's also that they're selfish and also that they don't care and also that they're rich enough that they won't really be affected by it. Mm. Lots and lots of things. But I think there's a, a decent portion of it is that I don't actually think some there are some people like that are actually really projecting into the future by very many years. Yeah, they just don't Maybe have not. a, have a sense think... of time itself. Or yeah. they find that they're invincible. Because it's also like this thing of like some, if the very rich might survive in bunkers, but I don't think they will because of the air quality, um, the fact that when the uh, ice melts, <laughs> it's going to release loads of prehistoric diseases. What are they, what are they who's, surviving for? Who's going to work for them? Like, <laughs> who's, the do you know thing, what I mean? There's, I have I think... a lot of questions about whether they will actually, <laughs> but they obviously think that they will. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it's, again, Don't Look Up was magic in. Have you seen Don't Look yeah, Up? I have. Yeah. Did you like it? I, I look. It was annoying and stressful, and yeah, it pretty much captures the feeling, right? Mm. Um, and I think you know. So in in Don't Look Up, spoilers for a movie that came out on Netflix ages ago. Um, sorry. Catch up. But yeah, no. At the end, where you know all of the rich people leave the planet that's being hit by a big a big rock fly, falling from the sky, they they go to another planet and they just all basically immediately die because of course they do. 
because a bunch of rich people, CEOs and whatnot, they're not they're not able to like you know run a society. They're not able to participate in a society um, and have that society be functional, right? Because fundamentally, what you have to end up like ultimately, what you have to end up doing is just like engaging in all of the things that they have avoided. They have paid people to do. So like, <laughs> in, like they're very quickly going to realize that oh, things are terrible now, and I don't have people that I can coerce into doing things for me by um, you know withholding basic necessities. Mm. So oh damn, I guess I should have just given up some of the of of the dragon's hoard I had stashed away. And maybe I could have still been coercing people to do into doing things for me. You know, like, I feel like that would be the realization mm. if they weren't, you know, dying from whatever. But let's, speaking of dying, uh, shall we talk about the health effects of climate change? What do you think, what do you think is going on with that? How do you think it affects health? Skin cancer. That's not one that I've got here. But yeah, I mean, like, you know, um, depletion of uh, the ozone layer. We got it back. Yeah. She's yes. back in town. Whoa. That, yeah, that can cause, you know, um, increased uh, rates of skin cancer. I mean, more UV rays. Yes. Um, you know, or rather, um, yeah, um, um, higher exposure to UV rays. Yeah. Increases one's risk of skin cancer. But also... Um, Air quality, Air quality as you're saying. is not good. I mean, if you think about London, lots of people actually die in London from the poor air quality. It's mm. not, I mean, it's reported on, but it's just kind of, we just kind of accept it mm. um, as part of, of sort of being here. Um, so just some stats for you. Um, as, we, as I've already mentioned, 3.6 billion people live in areas highly susceptible to climate change. Um, in vulnerable regions, the death rate from extreme weather event events in the last decade was 15 times higher than in less vulnerable ones. So it's not something, it, like it's gonna affect everyone. It's not gonna affect everyone equally. Mm. Um, vulnerable people uh, have been affected already and are still being affected. When you see old people dying um, or young people dying or just generally people dying during the summer in the UK, that's deaths from climate change. That's what that is, because it's getting too hot here. Um, same as, you know, if it, we get a really bitter winter, um, same thing goes there, right? These are all deaths from climate change that people just don't really think of. But um, also illness as well, you know, uh, tropical diseases. <laughs> Buddy, if things get warmer and the, these tropical diseases, oh, which can only oh exist no. in certain temperatures and certain climates, oh, yeah. start to migrate, that's not that's not good. The mosses okay. are coming. Yeah, and mm. then there's the prehistoric illnesses from the ice caps dying. Oh god. Is that you, like I like I That I've, was in the uninhabitable earth. How um sort of I guess problematic pre- is that? Do you know what I mean? Well, as in like will it be bad? Yeah, like I because I, I because <laughs> well, I, because we haven't got any we like we haven't developed any of the autoimmune the the immunity to those things and they're Really bad. <laughs> yeah. I really should have they, revised my facts on this. I'm like, real bad. They work on us, I suppose. That's you know? that's the thing that like yeah. I think that's uh, for me. I think of that and I'm like, that could be that's that could go either way. Where it could either be like really really bad or kind of okay. To, I like, don't want to find out. And I, yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> with I'm that. not interested in I'm that. Like, I don't have that curiosity <laughs> in me. I just I don't like, want to know. I feel like with all of this. You gotta take the, the wins where you can, or it's like yeah. that, that one isn't necessarily terribly bad. We that could just be put fine. it back on ice. Exactly. But I suppose like, like the bubonic it's, plague. It's if there's like mm-hmm. one that's like real bad. Yeah, it, all it, it takes is like one. ten million of them, and most of them don't work on us because it's been a long time. Mm. Uh, like trying to infect a, a Windows. What's what are you on now? Windows 11 with like a Windows 98 virus. Yeah. But w- if one of those Windows 98 viruses takes over the entire world of computers. That's still that's still pretty awful. Well, I've got a perfect um, little analogy for you. Um, it starts with a, a C and ends in COVID nineteen. We don't oh, need to. We don't need I've to. Heard of it. Yeah, we don't need to like mm. think about. Oh, what would happen if? A, no, we're still in a pandemic. Yeah. So. And that was Ooh. that could have relatively been a lot worse. I'm not saying that the COVID pandemic mm. wasn't bad, but it could have. I was sitting there for the first first few weeks thinking. This could be really shit. It could have been way worse than it was. Oh yeah, absolutely. Definitely. If it was, was more infectious or more deadly. Definitely. Whereas Corey in the first two weeks was looking at all of the data that was coming out and was following expert advice and then said that his opinion was if it's dealt with properly, this could be over in a few weeks, like swine flu. Because at the point that that was said, we didn't have enough evidence to say that it would be Let the record really show. bad. And also, the government dealt with it terribly, okay? <laughs> if they'd done a good job, we probably would have been less bad. I agree. Okay? 
Anyways, moving on. Thank you, Luke. But yeah, no, I mean, uh, there's going to mean more migrants and whatnot as well. Um, more people living in like sort of more dense areas, which again increases risk of disease. This is this has been a long time, and I'm sure we're going to have those classic comments of "You were talking not there's not enough science in this episode about science of climate anxiety." We're getting to it. All right, climate change is science. It's very important. Um, and like ultimately you don't need to know how it's happening we should all know how it's happening planet getting hotter because greenhouse gases drop heat in make planet hotter make make ocean hotter um ocean stores more heat and also ice starts to melt and then that starts to release more carbon into the air which then increases it's bad okay it's yeah. it's, it's it's a runaway train and we're not well, instead of trying to stop it we're like well we're gonna hit the wall at some point but maybe i'll have died by the time we do that so <laughs> there are secondary health effects to things like becoming a migrant as well because if you're if you if you live in an area that like your the value of your house has gone to zero because your town is going to be destroyed by rising sea levels and you have to move countries um yes you're going to make the ben Shapiro joke of just sell your house <laughs> Aquaman. Ben Shapiro lied to me? Ben Shapiro Aquaman lied to me. Aquaman is you. looking for a house. Yeah, Aquaman... And he wants to view yours. <laughs> Look, Aquaman on... has v- like basically no business acumen, okay? He <laughs> does not understand the, the laws of supply and demand. <laughs> he doesn't like, he, he doesn't get the housing market. So you could sell your zero value house to Aquaman. Well, but he has He'll plenty pay of cash. business. He has loads of business acumen then because he's going to buy all the houses. He's going to have loads of houses. Oh, <laughs> wow. He's going to be like all of our MPs. He's going to have hundreds of houses. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say, like, if you then have to leave your home and you have to, it, because countries start closing their borders and you have to go on foot, people die doing that. People mm. get ill doing mm. that. They then don't have any money because they put most of their money in their house mm. and they're now in poverty and there's health effects of poverty. Like there's all these horrible spiraling effects that are beyond just like the immediate effects of climate change. People will have to, like people die migrating mm. across different countries on yeah. foot. All the time. Yeah, yeah. And our government make tries to make sure of it. Sorry. Um, allegedly. No, not allegedly. No, they don't care. Um, <laughs> anyway. If they've made it this far in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They deserve. Ding, ling, ling. Are you there, God? It's me, the Ad Bell. Ugh, what do you want? I want the lovely listeners and viewers of Psy Guys to know that they can support the show without spending any of their own money. Right, and what do you want me to do about it? Well, I want you to tell them all that they can do that by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts for Psy Guys. Hello, Psy Guys listeners. It's me, God. You can support the show by going to Apple Podcasts and leaving a five-star, very nice review. And don't forget, if you don't have access to Apple Podcasts, it helps just as much to go ahead and leave a lovely YouTube comment. Amen. Are we done? I've got a plague to organize. Okay, okay, let's get back to the show. So we talk about um, climate anxiety. Mm -hmm. So uh, climate anxiety, does anyone want to hazard a guess at what it is? I have a feeling that it's not actually a medical term. It's two words that we've jammed together. Or have they actually started medically defining it? Well, no, to my knowledge, it's not medically defined. I mean, I think you can find something um, on the NHS about it, but like there's a lot of literature coming out about it. Mm. Um, And ultimately, I think... We can get to this in a, in a bit about my thoughts of the the, the term climate anxiety, but um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of research on how uh, climate change is affecting not just you know um, physical sort of somatic health, but also mental health. So not you know the kind of health we normally think about, but also how it affects your brains and minds, um, and not just in the sort of literal way that you might think of well climate change changes the environment and that changes certain things that make you uh, make your brain change um that is an effect you know like um pollution and and whatnot and you know all of these things can have an effect on your brain but just knowing what is happening is quite stressful so some stats here for you force of nature a youth nonprofit, um found that over 70 percent of young people feel hopeless in the face of the climate crisis up to 56 percent think that humanity is doomed and only 26% feel like they know how to contribute to solving the problem. So Mm. 74% uh, don't feel that they know how to contribute to the problem. I would love to know whether they, that 70% and that 20%, like 25%, you say, sorry. Uh, 26%. Yeah, 26%. Do they overlap? Do you know what I mean? Like, are the people who are worried about the climate also the people who know what to do about it? Or actually, because they know what to do mm. about it, are they worrying less? That's do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, how many, like, where's, where's, the, where's the Venn diagram there? Because I wonder, the more I learn about how we can solve it, the actual calmer I feel about it. And actually, I feel 
even though I don't, I know that I don't have the power, at least I know the part that I can do. And then everything else should be a little bit less stressful for me because I'm like, I'm doing what I can do. Yeah, fair you enough. You know what I mean? I think the idea of not knowing, like, it's kind of like when you find a lump, <laughs> you go yeah. for a scan and it's like before you've got a diagnosis, that's like the worst part I hear is like not knowing. I think partly for this as well, this is why I think the word anxiety is a little bit unhelpful here mm. because I think anxiety, we, anxiety, it, it is being correctly used to in, in like a literal sense because you know but we use the word anxiety in the same way if a lion's about to eat you and you run away and it's motivated by a activation of your fight or flight response and you run away from the lion as like anxiety disorder where like your anxiety your fight or flight response might be being triggered when there's not an actual stimuli where it's appropriate for it to be triggered right yeah we use the mm. same word for those two things anxiety when it's triggered by something that is helpful, something that is like actually happening, is helpful for motivating you to do something to change a situation, right? If mm. everybody had some anxiety about climate change, we would all be motivated to do something and we would vote people in who might do something and we might take some action. Um, whereas if there's an, an amount of anxiety you have that um, is disproportionate to the amount that you can do about it, um, that might be unhelpful for you, um, even though and it, even though it's, it's warranted. Obviously, it's warranted because you're flipping scared. Um, if, if it's like if it's not to do with motivating some action, um, it it's it is like it, I think that's where you could start talking about it as a sort of um, you could talk about it in a therapeutic context because it's there's nothing you can do about it, right? So it is ultimately unhelpful because it's not motivating action. But there's nothing that you can do about it as an individual, but yeah. there is something that can be done. I think that yeah, yeah. anxiety uh, to a non-solvable problem is different to anxiety to a solvable problem that is not directly within your power to solve. Right, okay, it, yes, you're it, right. So there's three versions. Mm -hmm. there's, there's anxiety to an unsolvable problem, unsolvable by anybody. Anxiety for a solvable problem, but not solvable by by you. And anxiety for a solvable problem that you can solve. Okay, yeah, you're right. I made a distinction there with, with two categories. There are actually three. Yeah, and also uh, anxiety towards a perceived problem that doesn't actually exist. There, is, there, okay, are, there are more categories. <laughs> we can come up with categories after category after category, but I think the point uh, that you've made still kind of stands, Luke, where, like, you know, um, it, I, get, well, I, I don't know if it does stand, you know, because I don't know if sort of, um, sort of medicalizing anxiety around an actual problem is beneficial. I mean, if we literally just look at the stats here, right? Um, 10,000 children, I say children, children and young people, people from 16 to 25 years old across 10 countries, Australia, Brazil, Finland, France, India, Nigeria, Philippines, Portugal, the UK and the USA um, with a thousand participants per country. Um, they, you know, they surveyed mm -hmm. all of these, uh, all of these young people um, to sort of figure out where they stood on sort of climate change. And 59% were very or extremely worried. 84% were at least moderately worried. 84% of, of the, you know, this 10,000 people across 10 countries were, like, moderately worried about climate change. That is mm. good in a sense of, yes, good. We, like, this generation understands the problem and is, you know, not feeling okay about it to, uh, to a, you know, a high degree. But, um you know... Uh, Sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, guilty. Those reported um, by more than 50% um, of people. Like, all of those different emotions were reported by more than 50% of people. And more than 45% of uh, respondents said that their feelings about climate change negatively affected their daily life and functioning. 75% said that, they, that the future is frightening. 83 said that they think people have failed to take care of the planet. So it's not just, like... Oh, I'm feeling anxious about this, and like I'm, I've, I like this is affecting my life, and I don't know what to do. It's I'm feeling anxious, and I'm angry, mm. like I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed, like I've been failed by my government, and that's um something that continuously comes up in all of the literature that I've read. That it's not just people feeling worried or stressed or at ill at ease. There is a very real sense of why has this happened to me? Because, mm. you know, I mean, for us, our generation, right? We've just been dumped in this from as, for as long as I can remember in primary school, you know, even they were talking about global warming back when you were, we were still calling it global warming before we changed it to climate change because conservatives uh, decided, uh -huh, global warming, but it's cold. It's colder <laughs> in winter. <laughs> How could it be warming? 
annoying. Um, but for as long as I can remember, we've been talking about climate change and global warming and how, you know, we just need to make the changes. We just need to reduce, reuse, recycle and start some green energy, which there's not enough. That we, does green energy work? Who knows? Blah, 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 blah. You know, all of that sort of stuff we've been fed. And, you know, over the past 20 years, what's happened? It's just gotten worse. Mm. I've not had any, I've not been able to do anything about it. Mm. I mean, I've only been able to vote for, you know, eight years, right? And how many general elections have I had in that time? One? You've lost all of them. Oh uh, yeah, wait, two maybe? I, I don't know. I don't think know. I've ever voted for something that's actually got in. No, 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 that, and I've I've been voting for like 12 years, maybe more. 13 years and I've never got what I, yeah, I've never no, got what I've I not, wanted. I've not had a single one. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, actually. Actually, Local elections. Keir Starmer was talking about this recently. I Boo, heard, sorry. But I heard him in an interview talking about how the experience of being in opposition is the experience of pretty much losing every single vote every single day you ever do anything. Mm. Because when you're in opposition, you don't have a majority and you pretty much just lose everything. But it's still important to turn up and do the vote. Yeah. Which is well, like, weird coming from the man that's deciding to uh, to turn into a Tory. But yeah, no, I guess the point the point does stand. <laughs> point just wants stands. to lose less votes. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it wants to lose less votes by because this is this is what bugs me. I'll just quickly say this: this bugs me about Labour, um, wherein and the Democrats do this too, where they're like, yeah, the people that are you know the marginalized groups that that support us and the people to the left. They're going to have to vote for us because it's either voting for us or mm -hmm. letting the worst people win. So we don't need to cater to them. We'll just cater to the people farther to the right that, you know, we can win our votes with. And I'm like, no, no, Feels actually, um, if you're going to turn into Tories, yeah. <laughs> being better, your, your entire sort of um, argument of voting for you as at least we're not them doesn't work if mm. you're basically them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It also only works in a, like a first past the post system. It doesn't work in like a proportional representation system. Yeah. Oh, you mean like a better voting system <laughs> sure. are, that, that has been consistently um, chucked out by the people Yet who benefit from it. another vote I lost <laughs> with a referendum. But yeah. Sorry, go on. I think that part of the, um, the if there are mental health precautions that we're not calling anxiety, I think it might be something more around maybe abuse or something where you're, you're told one truth but you're yeah. told to live in a different way and kind of gaslit mm -hmm. into believing that it's necessary for you to carry on as normal and that in the same way that you're describing labor it's just like oh well we're, we're not as bad as your last boyfriend we only punch you in the face <laughs> we've never thrown you down the stairs do you know what i mean i think it's actually that when we think about anxiety i think sometimes i i've i've felt anxiety but again it's it's hard because you there is the definition of anxiety um feeling like a threat is not the feeling that a threat that is not there is there or is anxiety feeling like a threat is immediate when it's actually not it's just so fear I kind of feel dread like or uneasiness really yeah you're yeah. I, I think a lot of people who experience anxiety um and i've experienced it as well is, is having the feeling that something is happening to you now mm. when it's not happening to you right now and i feel like a lot of the people who are surveyed you list all the different countries and i'm like probably the people in india who are experiencing climate anxiety are actually experiencing a real current threat, whereas the, the the young the young people in the UK aren't experiencing an immediate threat, but their body is telling them that they are. So oh, I'm smart. glad this you a, said this. I've got a fact face. I'm glad you've said this. <laughs> um, from that study, 92% uh, of those in the Philippines feel that the future is frightening compared to 56% in Finland. Philippines is far more affected by climate change uh, currently wow. than uh, Finland. But yeah, so the idea is here um, that, you know, people who are sort of more on the forefront of this, who are like really taking the brunt of it, um, are feeling worse about it, which makes sense, you know? Mm. I find it quite funny because you know how much some of these guys on whatever side's not me, uh, <laughs> like hate the idea of immigration mm. and also specifically reparations. Yeah. Um, the next generation are going to have loads of immigration and they're also basically going to be paying reparations for the previous generation's yeah. mm. mistakes, right? Like, the idea that like don't punish the, what is it, like don't punish the son for the crimes of the father or whatever. Um, like, like, like you said earlier, we're being punished or going to be punished for the crimes of like the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, when they knew that this was coming mm. and they didn't do anything, mm. like, anything at all. Uh, and the thing yeah. is, they thought uh, in a lot of cases, people thought that, yeah, this is not going to be a problem for a hundred years, blah, blah, blah. And you still see conservatives, and it is conservatives, pulling out, you know, predictions from climate scientists saying, ha, that hasn't happened yet. Ridiculous. Are you ignoring the fact that people are literally dying from climate change right now? 
whether like if maybe it's not as severe as people said, but like deaths from climate change are happening already, mm. you know, um, like probably earlier than most people thought. And when I say most people, I don't mean scientists. I mean, just regular average Joes and Josettes. Oh, yeah. I think if you ask an average person whether climate change deaths are happening now, they would say, no, that's in the future. Yeah. No, they're happening in the UK because every that's year. The yeah. narrative we mm. get in the media is like, we need to do something now or it's going to get bad. And it's like, well, no, it's already bad, just mm. not here. But it, it's still happening here as well. Yeah. Do you know I mean, that's what I want to be clear. Like, it, it is so much worse than other places, but like, we are mm. still having people die from climate change. Yeah. That's still happening. But it's mm. those types of deaths that sort of get erased as a statistic. Old people. As a statistic. It's like old people, disabled people, vulnerable yeah. people, like yeah. you know, think, breathing. When we think people problem. who are perceived as weak die, yeah. we think it's natural and yeah. that's part of the ableist. The that's, that, like what, that's like the COVID stuff. It's exactly. Like, oh. yeah. it's, and it just gets, it's the statistic. Uh, I can't remember, there was some statistic that was like, more people died today from air quality than died in this thing that people think is dreadful. Yeah. Like, yeah. I can't remember what it is, but like that, that puts it in perspective because you hear someone dying from like breathing problems and you don't necessarily associate that with, well, that wouldn't necessarily have happened if the air they were breathing was nicer air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's possible. Yeah. That's, we can, yeah. we can do this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, ultimately uh, there's just this overwhelming, and a lot of these studies are on Gen Z, you know, um, which I guess, Annoyingly, I, I I just hit that cusp and I fall into. Aww. So when I say our generation, I'm talking about millennials because um uh, feels. But I don't. Yeah, I'm on that cusp as well, more or less, and I don't identify with like the 35, 40 year olds. Like I see them as like di like they they're different to me. I, I identify with people in their mid to sort of late thirties more than I identify with a lot of. People Would you in say Gen we're Z. in the same generation? Yeah. Because we're like. I'm 33, so yeah, we're like eight we're, years, seven we're years apart. Seven, but yeah, but we're peers. I think we'd have the same references. We'd have probably watched the same Saturday morning TV shows, all the yeah. same. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we probably didn't have the like social media when we were 10. God, no. Yeah, no, exactly. You, right? I think like, that's a big break yeah, as well. I the people who it, had, yeah. oh, like when I was tweeting when I was nine, I'm like, what's going on? Like, why <laughs> you know? able to, yeah. I think yeah. that's the generational yeah. shift is about reference as well. Because how yeah. do you? I'm 29. But like, I don't I identify partially with Gen Z and partially with millennials. Don't look so sad about it. <laughs> no, but I think the issue with that divide is that. A yeah. lot of times it's it comes down to like, oh, I, I, do you understand social media? Then you're Gen Z. And it's yeah. like, I, I do. But I also understand it from the perspective of knowing that like I was on Tumblr in like 2012, 2014 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And like before, like I was on I was on Tumblr and I was on like YouTube before it was like, YouTube. I was on like I remember when Instagram like suddenly blew up as a thing. Do you know what I mean? Like I remember a time before this social media hellscape that we're all in. Um, existed, which we all love, by the way, because it pays our bills. We love it. Stay on the internet, kids. Don't stop scrolling. <laughs> Doesn't pay my bills anymore. I Shut got up. healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I got clean. <laughs> is that when you ring the ad bell? <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Is that the ad bell? Oh, God. I think the distinction is if you're bilingual in digital. Like I can yeah. explain a, what a Word document is to a boomer mm -hmm. because I understand what it's like not to know. Like I grew up faxing my friends. <laughs> what? You what? I used to fax okay, my friends. We're not the same. That's we're bad. not in the same generation. I used to draw drawings and fax them to my friend down the road. And then what I'd run the to her hell? house, knock on her door and be like, did she just get my fax? Okay, you're... No, <laughs> okay, maybe not. No. Anyway, I think... You can be millennial you when you just speak. Ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's gone. I've aged myself. Okay, so much like... happened in those three years. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but you know, to bring it sort of back to the, the sort of climate anxiety. Did you put your homework on a floppy disk? No. Oh. No, but I we, had no, but we had to. Oh, okay. But I didn't put my homework. We did on have it. to learn about them and how to use them, which was really annoying. In <laughs> history, right? Yeah. No, like, <laughs> uh, but seriously, it's just like. Like it, it was so outdated by the yeah. time that we. It's just yeah, like, no, nah, mine was mine was homework on a USB stick. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I think that's the, that's the divide right there. I feel like okay, no, no. Here's the here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, the main I think the main dividing line is how much more you know about technology than your teacher, because mm. millennials I think know oh, more yeah. about technology than their teachers. Gen Z are bad with technology because everything's so like so easy for them. Yeah. Like think about think about how Apple just made sort of apps for everything. Now, like, okay, if you call Twitter an app, you are a gen, you're Gen Z. You're, you're a Gen Z. Mm. Like, sure, <laughs> Twitter's sure. a website. Yeah. Like, it has an app, you yeah. know? I think that's the dividing line. But bringing it back to climate anxiety, <laughs> a lot of this is around um, people who are Gen Z. Um, and, you know, again, 60% feel climate-related uh, anxiety on a daily basis. Um, but 45% of young people feel climate-related anxiety and distress that affects their daily lives and ability to function normally, as I've said. 
Like, all of these things are impacting young people to a massive degree. And, like, in a sense, yes, of course it should. And, I mean, like, when I look at these studies, I don't see... Like, thankfully, I don't see people saying, you know, um, oh, wow, yeah, there's there's this sudden rise in anxiety um, around the climate about, like, you know, amongst this group of people. And how can we deal with it clinically? It's, no, the, the way to deal with this problem is to deal with the problem. Because, mm. like, I mean, I, I've, I've read a few studies, all linked below, by the way, that kind of talk about it uh, and talk about how trying to deal with it clinically is entirely kind of missing the point and i feel like you, if you're going to deal with that clinically you need to also create another one called climate numbness where like you or your children are going to be heavily impacted by climate change and you have not understood or accepted that and you're not anxious at all yeah like oh, that, should be, that, that should be also a disorder yes, yes. Well, if you're like completely like what i don't even know what you're talking about like if you have no concept and you it's not on your top 10 priorities that if you have children they will have a horrible time at least if you have children yeah, um, or you, that should also be a clinical... Because that's the thing is, like, this will ultimately be a test of us as a species and our ability to, um, like, model into the future and pay attention to what will happen in the future and take action. The animals don't really mm. do that very much. Mm. What separates us from them is our... Like, one of the things is our ability to, like understand like th how things will turn out like years from now mm. which animals might do on a subconscious level but they probably aren't doing on a conscious level mm. if, if we don't survive this we don't deserve to survive it and something will replace us oh yeah that mm. probably will be better at modeling into the future like that fingers crossed yeah mm. but you're right it's the pe like do you treat the people who like when you find out your house is on fire start running around being like oh god there's a fire <laughs> all the people who are like that sounds fine i'll just stay at the top of the house and wait for it to burn down yeah. like you're right we're treating the wrong people when you're experiencing climate anxiety you might just be experiencing reality yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i think like if we talk about sort of maladaptive behaviors and whatnot this sort of climate numbness that you're talking about there luke that's maladaptive right yeah. That is that is the behavior that is not healthy. Yes. Right? That's what evolution's for. Being real being anxious about about a lion that's about to eat you is a healthy thing to be anxious about. Yeah. Mm. Hey guys, I've noticed that, you know, we've been leaving a lot of like, you know, meat around and carcasses <laughs> and it's been attracting a lot of lions. <laughs> and like, you know, m maybe if we if we start moving all of the carcasses now, the lions won't eat us. I don't see any mm. lions right now, Cory. Right, but I think you're crazy. Yeah. Right, but you got lion anxiety. But do you remember how, like last week, um, that was last week. Greg that was, was eaten week. by a lion. Yeah, I you remember how you that stop giving him those lion books. God, <laughs> he's obsessed. <laughs> oh, right, and like it's, it, but it's it's that, and also I think we've got this sort of confluence of you know um, technology and and sort of medical advancements where people are living longer and being healthier for longer, which is great. What isn't great? is that we have a society wherein power is uh, and, and wealth are compounded um you know just consistently and if people are living longer and being uh, healthier and like you know uh, essentially kind of being more capable for longer periods of time it, it means that sort of switch over in wealth is just not happening the way that it should right like mm -hmm. if we look back to and people are asking like oh is this really about yes all of this comes together. You can't separate the current sort of um, climate crisis we're in right now from the capitalist system that, you know, essentially sort of like, you know, uh, set the path for it, right? Um, and ultimately what's going on is we've got like people taking all of the wealth and holding on to it. And that's not being passed down mm -hmm. at all. I mean, yes, think about the fact that you could buy a house relatively easily like 50 years ago you know i don't know what year it is right now but uh, when people who are alive now were younger right people who own a lot of people who own houses now bought them many many years ago for way less than they're worth now and now people can't afford them not only that people don't have savings or you know like any of the sort of material wealth necessary to be as comfortable as the people that came before them and along with that there's no there's not the same sort of power there, you know, with wealth comes power. There's not that power there. And also on top of that, there are people who are just living and s staying in office, you know, especially in the US. You've got people who are like too old to be doing the job that they're doing. Like realistically, not to be ageist here, but some like some people genuinely <laughs> like have dementia and are not being removed from office, mm -hmm. right? And like, 
why? Why, like, we, if we, like, from the looks of this, right, Gen Z, people uh, 16 to 25, um, perhaps people, like, slightly older than that, millennials as well, seem to be, like, genuinely worried about the, about climate change. But we don't yet have that transition of power to us where we can do anything about it. So we're stuck in the back seat of this car careening into a river, being like, can we, like, can, is, when is it going to be my turn to drive? Because, like, I mm -hmm. would very much like to do a U-turn and get us out of the situation, but I can't while you're still, you know, behind the wheel. And I just feel like, oh, it's so frustrating. I Every saw a tweet oh. the other day that was like, I know that we're all very busy. We've all got a lot going on, but it does seem like there needs to be some kind of revolution. What? <laughs> and it does feel like the way that it's just like, oh God, I think there's going to have to be. Well, yeah, with this. And I'm bad at that. I don't know how to do a revolution. Uh, You'll manage, I'm sure. But I don't know. I, I feel like very, like my dad was asking me about my pension the other day and I do pay into a pension, mm. but like I feel very ambivalent about whether that pension's ever, <laughs> you know, it feels very immediate to me. Yeah. I'm just like, and that's that might sound like a really depressing fact to somebody. And I think I, you know, it comes from a place of climate anxiety, maybe, but I think it's also just a very logical, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> will, it, will it happen? Will I get my pension? Yeah. I, I just feel, know. I feel like what you're saying about revolution. Yeah. I mean, with this, I mean, things like even sort of how trans people are being treated right now, mm -hmm. LGBT people as a whole, like migrants, um, the current, um, I don't even want to call it a war, but the occupation of Gaza right now, um, I say right now, we are filming this a little bit in advance and this that situation is developing um, mm. very quickly. So God knows what's happening. Who knows how far into their ethnic cleansing um, they'll be by the time this comes out. But ultimately, you know, like all of this stuff that's going on and government's not really seeming to do very much about it. And even Keir Starmer, you know, Labour in the UK, just kind of leaning into the right wing end of it. Mm. Lads, like you, you need to understand that we all hold the power. I mean, I know, I know you understand that we all hold the power. Um, and you just like if you keep on pushing it, people are going to realize that and start chopping heads. You know, and mm. I don't even know if I mean like you know figuratively. Like people are gonna like heads are probably gonna roll. There is gonna be a revolution at some point if you keep pushing this the way that you're pushing this, right? Mm. Like it's just I, I think people in power feel too safe right now and you they should as again way too Christian. Yeah. even no, the like, ambivalent british do have a, a boiling point <laughs> like, <laughs> like, even us yeah we'll take so much uh, uh, look scotland <laughs> is the is the main thing right if england keep on uh kind of doing what they're doing to scotland ah man i feel like we're uh, oh we can only take so much you yeah. know what i mean like, it's fair everybody's getting fisted <laughs> And nobody's and having not fun. Not in a fun way. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Everybody's getting fisted and nobody's having fun. But yeah. <laughs> not in a fun way. It's just... And but I, yeah, it, I think it's kind of this idea of like eco-anxiety. Are, are we just medicating anger? Are mm. we trying to medicalize rational anger? And where does that anger go if we don't medicalize it? But we're not. So that's, that's, that's exactly what I was about to say. I've got this lovely quote from a paper which you can find down below. It's the one where they surveyed 10,000 children. Um, you know, it says, there is an urgent need for further research into emotional into the emotional impact of climate change on children and young people and for governments to validate their distress by taking urgent action on climate change, right? So, um, you know, <laughs> realistically, there aren't people claiming like, oh, what do we do about this? And like, yes, we can treat... Um, people for anxiety when it's getting in, in the way of their daily sort of like living just based on the fact that you know it would be good for people to be able to you know i guess engage in society be good little worker drones and also for them to be moderately happy i guess as well but like the real treatment here the real cure is governments doing what they need to do for the people and failing that revolution <laughs> I, I, I yeah, and I suppose that when it comes to, on a personal level, I feel like I've I've become less anxious by not gaslighting myself. <laughs> so even do you know, even if yeah. if I'm like the government's gaslighting me, other people in my life, but I'm gonna do you know what I mean? Just admit it to myself that this is what I believe. Yeah, and it seems true. Yeah, and then start living a little bit like that if you can, in whatever way. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. It's it's tough. And like I want, sorry, I've got some more stuff here that mm. I just want to add from the different papers. You know, it talks about. Um, the media being full of stories about climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, climate grief, um, and, and and all of these sorts of things. But like ultimately, th this is an uh, an impact of climate change on top of all of the on top of all of the health impacts we've spoken about already. Um, and it doesn't seem to be pathological. That's the key thing here, right? And when we 
like create a sort of um, mental health disorder of something, we're pathologizing it, right? You know, we pathologize um, autism, we pathologize ADHD, we pathologize certain behaviors, you know? And in this sense, um, anxiety doesn't indicate a problem with mental health, as we've been saying, right? Um, and this is all coming from like a paper which you can find down below again, but anxiety can be an adaptive function, is a quote, like quite literally, a an adaptive function. Um, and it's important to avoid pathologizing the emotional response to climate change. And a focus on mental health can imply that the emotional response is inappropriate, right? Um, it's just it's just ridiculous. Like this is more significantly more significantly affecting younger people. Um, realistically, the people who are going to have to deal with this, the people who had no choice in this, are the people who have been born into a world that is doomed immediately, you know, uh, from their conception, from their birth, they have been born into a doomed world. And feeling bad about that is is very normal you know um so do something i get that's <laughs> do 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 something do anything yeah yeah anything uh, mm, anything Maybe positive not anything. but yeah no i mean ultimately and another another part of this conclusion i think is really sort of um uh, it's really sort of i wouldn't say profound but i, I like the quote uh, climate change is not just an environmental but also a psychological problem um and it is it's mm. a psychological problem it's 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 watching the end of the world happen in slow motion. It's mm. horrid. Um, and that's really what I've got to say on climate anxiety. It doesn't really exist. It's just um, it's just it's just climate change in it. It's that's just it an is. accurate response to a real fact. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like it's right, not yeah. in our heads. No, it's not in our heads. No. It is it is you reacting appropriately to what is going on around you. Mm. That's what I'd say, and that's what many scientists would say as well. Well. Seems like it's just time for a quick fire quiz. <gasps> dun 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 dun! Climate anxiety edition. Ah! Oh no! Oh! So the rules for the quick fire <laughs> quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I finish asking the question wins. What do they win, Luke? A bucket with which to pail the water out of their house as it sinks below <laughs> the sea level. It's all to play for. <laughs> <laughs> Does that increase the price that Aquaman pays? Huh? It means he has to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> wait a little bit longer. <laughs> and Luke, what is your buzzer? Ah. And Lena, what's your buzzer? <laughs> Just a Don't goblin being scared from. of climate change. <laughs> so my question for you is, the youth nonprofit organization Force of Nature found that what percentage of young people feel hopeless in the face of climate crisis? Ah. <laughs> oh, I, I saw Lena move first, so I'm going to give it to you. 70%. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Yes. One. Well done. That's that's a that's a pretty horrible statistic to end yeah, on. Have a moment of silence. <laughs> well, that is all from us. But before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and Glitch Rabbit. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash guys, or you can find and contact us at Sci Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at Sci Guys on TikTok too. <laughs> Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod. Wow, a performance. <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> you can follow me at not Corey everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cupboard everywhere. And you can follow me at Lena Norms everywhere. Why are you looking at me? Look at them. Everywhere. Bye. Apart from TikTok. <laughs>